Hi, it's Dwyer, always, 1776.com, a free site. Also, wealthspinning.blogspot.com, a free site. It is Monday, September 16th, 2024. Remember, nothing I say in this video should be construed as investment advice. I want everyone to do their own due diligence. The opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, there was a jaw-dropping moment. Um, it stayed with me in the presidential debate. Uh, I can't believe how poorly the issues are being discussed this election cycle. In the moment, former President Donald Trump was talking and he talked about the benefits of tariffs. And he pointed out to Kamala Harris that the money that our government, the American government was making off tariffs was so great that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris continued to collect money off the tariffs which, of course, the government could then use for other things, right? Now, I just want to point out that this centerpiece of the Trump campaign, in fact, it's a centerpiece of Trump's political identity, this idea that tariffs help Americans is completely phony. Folks, it's wrong. I'm telling you, Trump has esteemed economic advisors, Art Laffer being one of the main ones, who has pointed out to the former president that his understanding of economics here is wrong, right? Let's talk about why it's wrong. I want people to fully grasp the idea that tariffs are a bad idea across the board that you are losing money on tariffs, that what's really happening is that the American government is taxing you. You, the voter, the consumer, lose money off the deal. So let's give an overly simplistic example, right, that doesn't happen in real life, but by analogy, is happening in the worlds of tariff. Excuse me, in the world of tariffs. Let's say you have bills to pay. Just hypothetically, you're paying rent or a mortgage. You have children, and a child's birthday is coming up. Maybe you have an older mom or dad who likes to see you and the grandkids. And it costs money for you to travel to where mom and dad live, right? It's a multi-day trip. Sometimes it involves a plane ticket. Um, you know, you have to care for the kids away from home. You're not paying grocery prices. You're actually paying restaurant prices when you're on the road. Let's say you're counting dollars, right? And let's say at work. Some people have been let go. You're a little bit insecure about your job. You're looking at your savings. You're wondering how long you can last if they were to tell you that you're laid off. And you're also aware of the fact that the company isn't doing well. Maybe two years ago, they would have given you a severance of four months. You understand now you'd be lucky to get a severance north of two months. Uh, you're just feeling lucky to think that you might be able to get a severance at all if you were to get laid off. So you go to the gas station, right? Now, let's say you privately know that gas that's imported from overseas, let's say Russia, has a huge advantage. Let's say we weren't um, boycotting Russian gas, Russian energy, right? Let's say that importing from Russia, they can do it for $4 a gallon. 
right? And you're thinking, man, I'm glad to read this in the financial papers because I could use the extra money, right? Let's say your SUV takes $20 to fill up, right? Excuse me, not $20. We know that's a myth. Let's say it takes 20 gallons to fill up. I'm using round numbers uh, just for purposes of this example. So you're thinking to yourself, wow, you know, American gas would cost $5 a gallon. I'm saving a dollar a gallon times 20. That's 20 bucks in my pocket. Maybe I can take the kids to McDonald's here and get some of their discount meals, right? Buy three discount meals. You're, you know, thinking, great, let me save the 20. The problem is, of course, you get to the gas station and you find out that there is no option for $4 a gallon gas imported from overseas, right? Because Donald Trump and the government have imposed a $1 a gallon tariff on imported gasoline. So you end up without the choice, without the $20 worth of savings for this transaction. You end up paying $5 a gallon for American gas. Now, let's just think about the fallout there, right? Let's say the government is crowing about the fact that they collected a dollar a gallon off imported gas, right? And that you have no choice but to pay the cost of an American gallon of gas, whatever you buy. Right? Well, just understand that money has come from your pocket. You lost the $20 worth of savings. Right? This money didn't materialize from elsewhere. No, you, the consumer, lost the $20. Some politician can say, oh, we collected so much from some foreign government so they can have access to our markets. Right? Understand, you're the one paying the bill. You're the one who didn't get the gas at $4 a gallon. You had to pay the $5 a gallon. Right now, let's think further. Is American industry, which can produce $5, and this is all hypothetical, $5 a gallon gas, are they competitive on the world stage? And of course, the answer is no. Right. If the low cost provider can provide gas at four dollars a gallon, which would benefit American consumers, American producers are uncompetitive at five dollars a gallon. Why would the government be protecting uncompetitive American industry? Right, folks, that doesn't work. That's a misallocation of resources. Understand, let's say your oldest son, who's attending MIT, is a genius, right? Let's say your oldest son might be interested in trying to improve the efficiency of American gas production so that that $5 can drop down to $4 and actually be competitive with the rest of the world, right? Well, why would your son do that when the government is penalizing low-cost providers, right? There's less incentive to have an unproductive part of the American economy become productive so that it's competitive with the rest of the world. Entrepreneurs who would be working to reduce the cost of American industry in a world of distorted prices, thanks to government tariffs, would have far less incentive to do so because the government is going to protect American industry. Let's talk about fragility in the system. If an American producer isn't competitive, on price, on a worldwide level, then understand the jobs in that industry are vulnerable, aren't there? 
right? You're going to have black markets pop up, right? Where some person figures out, hey, I can import gas for $4 a gallon overseas and sell it to consumers for four fifty. It's a win-win. I get 50 to, uh, cents in profit per gallon and they get a 50 cent break from this ridiculous American tariff. Right, just understand, you're encouraging black markets. You're encouraging crime. You're encouraging vulnerable employment. Because if the market price reverts to the actual world price, then people are going to get laid off. Right? You're putting a cap on American industry because we can't match the price overseas and we aren't even working to match the price overseas because our government is distorting prices domestically. So you would hope in a presidential election year like this one that you, the voter, would have a choice to pick free markets, not rigged markets. Sadly, of course, Kamala Harris couldn't really respond to Trump because the Biden administration adopted the Trump tariff plan. So folks, you the voter, you the American consumer, are currently paying much higher prices than you should be. Let's go one step further. These politicians who are shameless then have the audacity to pass meaningless, ineffective bills like the Inflation Reduction Act. If you want to reduce inflation, drop all these Mickey Mouse tariffs. Right, understand, with tariffs in place, foreign countries with lower price, superior products have little incentive to participate in the American market. You drop the tariffs, you make it a level playing field, and you'll be surprised how many brands of Chinese electric vehicles are out there. You'll be surprised at the lower prices being offered for possibly higher quality products. You want competition because when you have competition for consumer dollars, the winner is almost always the consumer. Right, so folks, this is a downtime for the American economy. It's a downtime for American politics. You don't really have a choice here between the Democrats and the Republicans on the issue of tariffs. And it's a bad idea. Just Google the detrimental effects of tariffs. Just Google the lower equilibrium tariffs cause, the price to the consumers that tariffs cause versus free market economics. Let's talk about something else. We're hearing that the Fed, and these people, in my opinion, have no special expertise, right? None whatsoever. We're hearing that the Fed is going to increase the money supply. They can call it something else. They can call it rate cuts, right? They're going to increase the money supply. They're cutting rates to free up fiat money. Right now, what I want people to consider, and I know this is heresy, because we're all trying to avoid a recession, right? Let me ask a foundational question. Are you better off working for an insolvent company? Or are you better off working for an economically viable company? that's actually subject to the price swings, the price dynamics of a free market economy, 
Right, folks, I'm just telling you, when you prop up insolvent companies, companies that are borrowing money to keep their doors open, right, folks, this is what happens with companies like Big Lots, for example, right? Many of these companies that ultimately end up filing for bankruptcy, Boston Market, are upside down. They're borrowing money to keep their doors open. Your job is already untenable long term. This is what the bankruptcy courts are made for, right? So let me just make a simple point here. Maybe starving off in recession isn't the best idea. Maybe when things are mispriced, when we're looking at increased unemployment because there's a misallocation of assets, right? Maybe manipulating interest rates, um, you know, trying to give money. One of the worst ideas I've heard in my life, give money to new home buyers, public money, money from the U.S. Treasury to prop up a housing market that is already overextended. Maybe ideas like that aren't good ideas. Maybe they actually cost all of us that much more. Why are we propping up the housing market? You want affordable housing? Why don't we just let the market clear? Right? Rather than promise new homeowners $25,000 in public money to prop up the Ponzi scheme that is the real estate market, right? Where people are paying many more times a community's median income on housing costs than prior generations, than our parents' generation. Rather than do that, why don't we actually let the housing market clear? And by that, I mean, let the market set the prices. We don't need politicians coming in with, you know, efforts to take on more debt as if that's going to work out well. Take on more debt to encourage young people to participate in an overextended market. Wouldn't it be better to actually have what's happening in Florida right now take place where housing is dropping in some areas because the prices of, house, of houses has just gotten too damn high. People are borrowing too much money. Lenders who are fragile already in this economy. I'm telling you, the banking sector is under pressure. Are making these loans that the borrower can't pay. If there's a group that doesn't fully understand the carrying costs of owning a home, it's first-time home buyers, isn't it? Right? They don't fully understand property taxes. They don't fully understand upkeep. When you're a renter, you pick up the phone, the landlord fixes the pipes. When you're a homeowner, you're the person who fixes the pipes. And that can be very expensive. Right? Just understand, we have to let markets clear. We're not better off papering over, and that's what we're doing, recessions. Right? Flooding the market with money, making loans to insolvent debtors. Right, folks, that only works until it stops working. You understand that commercial real estate right now is in a depression, don't you? More importantly, shouldn't you? It doesn't help if the government suddenly comes in with programs that put a Band-Aid on a deep gash and keep the patient from bleeding out for just a few more months. That doesn't work. You know, forests need fires to clear out some of the dead wood. Right? It doesn't work if you don't have a fire. You're going out of your way to make sure there's no fire, and then you have a lot of dead wood, and then you end up with a five-alarm blaze that completely decimates what was the forest. So what I want people to think about here 
is that it, the inflation rate has dropped. Right? The economy is bad off. Many people are working for insolvent companies. You know, we're going to have to accept the idea that some of these companies aren't sustainable. That they're going to fail, whether it's now or later. Right? Imagine the number of horse and buggy companies that existed at the time of the automobile. Right, folks, you can spend a lot of time trying to protect every job in the horse and buggy industry. You and I know that's unsustainable long term. So it is now. Let me just say, I hope the Fed, and I know this is not going to happen, we're going to get a 25 basis cut at least. I hope the Fed doesn't increase the money supply. I'd like to see a recession now. I'd like to see the forest cleared of all of these overpriced homes, of all of these unsustainable businesses that are living off banknotes. Right? I want to see us do away with all these ridiculous tariffs. Trump may call it a tariff, I call it a tax on Americans. Right, folks? You want relief, get rid of the tariffs. Have other producers competing for your dollar. Roll up someplace and be able to buy goods and services from the low-cost provider. Not some ineffective company that's charging more than the low-cost provider but that's actually protected by a government tariff. Right, folks, the dialogue is poor here. Of course, this is that rare election year where you have a former president going up against someone who was not the top of the ticket in any political primary. Right? Maybe a president elected in 2016 isn't completely in tune with what's happening in 2024. Maybe someone who did not receive a single primary vote isn't ready to take the bold step, and it shouldn't be bold, of actually bringing us back to free market economics. Right? The end result is that the Republicans and the Democrats aren't giving the American voter an opportunity to participate in a deflationary free market economics economy. Right? What we have instead is some $35 trillion plus debt without any real plan to drop that any real talk of dropping entitlement programs. Instead, we have a Fed that, of course, is going to increase the money supply any time we start having stresses on the capital market. Folks, that's treating the symptoms, not the disease. Let's just throw out a couple of investment ideas. Folks, in a climate like this, where prices have gone haywire. You need to ask yourself, what's a reliable store of value? If you think it's the bond market, if you think it's American fiat currency, I believe you're kidding yourself. Right? Just consider gold. You don't have to be a genius here. You have a gold miners ETF, the GDX. If you want... If you want a leveraged um, ETF, consider NUGT. Um, I know the price is hopelessly volatile, but uh, Bitcoin in volatile and involatile markets has a limited supply, right? No one can suddenly say to you, we're going to increase the Bitcoin supply. That's just not possible. Right. Let me also add too, and I don't want to get too wonkish here. I believe greatly in DeFi. I understand there's some proof of stake cryptocurrencies in DeFi. 
uh, that are well positioned. Just to understand, I prefer proof of work. Um, Bitcoin is not the only player in the proof of work stake uh, part of the market. Consider Caspa, K A S P A. Right? I'm just telling you that sooner or later the market is going to realize that there's no real value in fiat currency. And that really the value is in these limited supply items like gold and silver, precious metals, and proof of work, limited supply, digital assets. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. Understand Caspa is selling right now for less than 20 cents a coin. I think it's worth a look. It's available on uphold.com. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. I know there is a group out there. Trust me, I look at my subscribers drop every time I make one of these high risk videos. I know there's a group out there that really does believe in the sharpness of governments, management of fiat currency. Right, nothing is going to get them off that position, not even the Silicon Valley bank problems. Right, okay, fair enough. Um, you know, I understand that. Um, please feel free to voice those views in the comment section of this YouTube video. Right, let's have a robust public discussion. Uh, just to understand my view. Right, the idea of tariffs is a loser, mercantilism. Uh, tariff-based protection of local producers, that's been proven to be a loser in history. Right? Just look back at the McKinley uh, administration, uh, many of the uh, American administrations of the 19th century when they pursued that path. Right? We're in a global economy. Right now, it's staggering to know that China is having the economic problems that they're having and there isn't some movement by the American business community to work with China to help rebuild their economy while receiving profits and the ownership of assets in that economy. Right? That's the America I grew up with. I have no idea what's happening now. I hear Donald Trump talking about tariffs and I have to pinch myself and I'm like, whoa, you've got to be kidding. This is where the GOP is now. I don't even understand it. Right? I don't know how anyone could live through the early 80s and recognize this GOP right now. Right? I'm not saying the GOP of the early 80s, the Reagan era, was perfect. Right? But at least there was an honest talk about free market economics. You're not even getting that now. Also, Understand one basic truth, and I know no one says this. The American economy is built on unrealized gains. Right, folks? That's the entire thought process behind Rich Dad, Robert Kiyosaki's financial education. Right? You want to own assets that appreciate in value. You get a tax break off of not realizing the gains. Right? Kiyosaki, in good times, would go even further and say you, you should be willing to borrow money to buy assets that appreciate in value if the rate of appreciation exceeds the interest rate on the money you borrow. Right? Now we have a presidential candidate with the mind-blowingly economically illiterate opinion that we should be taxing unrealized capital gains. Let me just say, from where I sit, that should have been the centerpiece of the presidential debate because the idea is that mind-blowingly bad. Right? Unfortunately, we're in an era where We've gotten away from free market economics, where the ideas couldn't be worse, and where the candidates themselves are bragging about their terrible ideas. So Trump is bragging about tariffs.
Kamala Harris is pushing taxing unrealized gains. Let me also say another truth. I've spoken to people and they say, oh, well, those onerous taxes would only be on the super wealthy. Folks, who do you think is running this economy? When's the last time you shopped on Amazon? Do you really want Jeff Bezos turning over a significant portion of his wealth to the federal government? First, let me ask a foundational question. Who do you think is going to use that wealth to enrich Americans more effectively? Jeff Bezos, who has built the Amazon empire and who is employing tens of thousands of people, who is helping people, you know, in rural areas, in areas that don't have uh, a lot of malls and things like that, get goods and services at cheap prices. Or the U.S. government, which right now has a debt north of $35 trillion. Right, folks, just, just ask yourself, do you want any taxation set up? where you're gutting the wealth of the billionaires who have created the companies that employ so many. Right, folks, it, the whole thing is a head-scratcher. Let me hear from you. And I don't want to hear about fair share and stuff like that. That's a completely fake argument. Right? I uh, go to a McDonald's. Right? Understand. I have my own needs. I have my own family. I'm looking for a break today. I'm looking for food at a price that makes it worth me hopping in my car and going to a McDonald's. Right now, I don't understand how we got to a point where, you know, suddenly we're talking about a living wage. Right, folks? Please understand. You can't have it both ways. You can't have immigrants crossing the border trying to come to the United States for the economic opportunity. That's what the market wage provides. And then tell us that people can't live on the market wage. That doesn't make any sense. Also, if we're going to talk about fair well, what about the consumer? If I'm going to go into McDonald's, buy my kid a meal, buy myself a meal, and then get hit with a $25 bill, that's unfair to us. If there are people willing to work in the McDonald's to make it a win-win, where they value the money they get from the McDonald's, let's say $10 an hour. Right here in California, by the way, it's mandated that McDonald's pay $20 an hour. Think about that. That's how one way it is. Right, there are people willing to work in McDonald's for $10 an hour, right? Some of them are retired folks, older people. You see them as greeters in Walmart. Some of them are young kids with their first job. They're getting valuable experience, right? And of course, I'm always willing to go to a McDonald's if I'm getting a price break, not $25 for a meal for me and my child. No, I'm, I'm looking for a break today, right? The politicians want you to feel that you're being oppressive, that you're exploiting people. If you want to go to McDonald's, buy a meal for less than $25, have workers at McDonald's who are comprised in part of young kids in college trying to get beer money, right? Older people trying to make ends meet. Somehow you're being exploitative. So understand what happens when you mandate prices. The young people don't get jobs, right? Because, of course, the McDonald's is going to look at them and say, gee, is this person worth $20 an hour with no work experience? Right? You're going to have a different group who view what should be seasonal work as a career. 
right? They're going to want $20 an hour with raises, with benefits. Who's ultimately going to pay for that? Folks, it's going to be you. And of course, the franchisee, who is going to have fewer customers walk in the door because the prices are higher. The prices are no longer competitive with buying groceries and cooking at home. Exactly what you were trying to avoid doing by going to the McDonald's, right? You're looking for a break, not more time over the stove in the kitchen uh, or more time by the microwave. It's modern life, uh, cooking up a meal for your kids, right? So understand the franchisee no longer has the big customer base. They have to pay more. They can't give the kid at the high school the break to work on the job because the stakes are too high. Let me hear from you. I look forward to your comments. Thanks for stopping by.